Join me, if you will, um, at Numbers, the 13th chapter. We're going to Numbers chapter 13. Uh, we have a word from the Lord that I think is going to be paramount to you. Um, it's going to be paramount to you. We have been endeavoring to create uh, a framework for strategic life, strategic thinking, strategic relationship, um, and strategic thought. And we have been trying to give a palette for those of you that have been engaging the book, The Art of War. We've been trying to instill within you the disciplines that uh, uh, strategy entails. It's a phenomenal read. Uh, it, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This is something that I live by. Scholarship saves lives. Scholarship saves lives. I cannot tell you how many people around the world are dying because they are connected to somebody else's ignorance. I mean, from bad teaching, bad doctrine, limited worldview and how they understand things. I can't tell you how many thousands of people will not come into the faith because of how wrong or erroneously salvation was presented. So we want in this church to have a value for scholarship. I mean an important value for scholarship, for critical investigation of bodies of work and bodies of information that help us to live, all right? Now that doesn't mean that you have to go and get a billion degrees, but you do need to discipline yourself to read and investigate, to live the type of life that you want. Say amen. Uh, and so Sun Tzu's book is a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, scholarship scholarly writing and the principles as we've said before can be applicable to everything I was studying yesterday and there was a quote and I read this book every year for the last five there was a quote that I came against that really 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 stirred me and it said that the battle is won first in the temple before the war begins through contemplation a man plans and win his war so he understood the power of clarity in and from the temple before you pick up any weapon isn't that powerful and and so today I've got two messages that I'm going to give you that's directly connected to Sun Tzu's main philosophy, which is this. If you know yourself and you know your enemy, you may never win a million battles. He also says if you don't know yourself and don't know your enemy, you will lose at every place, every place. You're going to lose. So self-knowledge is where we're going to go this morning um, because I sent something trying to be born in the spirit that I want to deal with today. We are in Numbers chapter 13, verse 17. Are you there? When Moses sent them, this is Numbers 13, 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on to the hill country and see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, what kind of land do they live in? Is it good? Is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land, for it was the season of first ripe grapes. So then they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Libo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where Ahiman, Seshai, and Talmud, it sounds like a bunch of sushi rolls, the descendants of Anak live. Hebron had been built for seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. Here is our meat. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran and there they reported it to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The, the Hittites, the Jebusites and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites lived there near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said 
we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it but the men who had gone up with him said we cannot attack these people because they are stronger than we are and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored they said the land we explored devours those living in it and all the people we saw there were of a great size we saw the Nephilim there which were the descendants of Anak who come from the Nephilim and we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them father help me to preach this in Jesus name amen my assignment this morning is really brief but there is a revival coming to your identity will you put your hand on your chest and say I am not a grasshopper come on say it again I am not a grasshopper the book of Numbers is an extremely critical book because it's the transitory book uh, before the nation conquers and enters into the promised land called Cana. And uh, we have studied the dramatic nature of what this story entails. I'd like you to understand why this is significant to you because each of the Bible patriarchs from Adam to Abram to Moses represent what the Lord can do in and with obedience that's a sermon right there um, obedience is a capacity and a depth and a steering wheel by which the hand of God can turn any person into something mighty uh, and uh, obedience now is the superpower of the people of God when you do not know what to do don't you ever relinquish the power to obey it is a weapon of God in your hand obedience has the power to stifle the works of darkness obedience has the power to accelerate resources in your life obedience has the power to help you accurately and rightly identify danger and trap on your way there so at all costs and by any means you must obey and obey quickly and you must never allow the enemy to do something in your soul that makes you fearful of obedience uh, obedience is is like the dynamite that sets off the works of God around you when you press the button of obedience there's like a season of fireworks that comes off around you and there'll be favor here favor there favor everywhere you must obey and the challenge with this obedience is it creates the paths for the people you are responsible for to follow stay with me now numbers now is right before Deuteronomy and you know that the book Deuteronomy is the book called the second law it is a reiteration of the cultural that was necessary to dress the children of Israel for the promised land. Now we know that they don't go in until Joshua but the reason why Deuteronomy is critical because it shows the power of or the book of Numbers I'm sorry it's critical because it shows the power of a plan. It reveals the power of making sure that you have a detailed well thought out plan. Now let me put a caveat there. Many of us run into the strong man of discouragement because we try to execute an underdeveloped plan. We, we do not think about and reach into the components, the possibilities, but even the risks, the strength level of a plan. Now there is power in planning carefully. It takes time to have a good plan. You don't come up with a good plan in one week. If you come up with a plan in one week, there are going to be some weaknesses and there are going to be some entry points because you've not thoroughly considered if this plan can work in every season if this plan can work in every environment or whether or not you've got the resource to implement it accurately so I've got some points to lift to you but before I do slap somebody on the shoulder and prophesy and tell them take your time take your time come on tell them that open your mouth tell them take your time do not allow people to rush you do not allow the culture to rush you do not allow your age to rush you do not allow your marital status to rush you don't let it rush you take your time because a plan that is not developed is a plan that will not be executed 
Moses is the leader of massive proportion whose life is like a story and he embodies as it were God's dealing with a leader and what God does in and to the life of somebody who will impact many lives. Uh, he reveals how God grooms, how God trains, how God challenges, how God measures and all of us know he was born to traumatic backgrounds and, and traumatic experiences with which is why it is important to pay attention to lives that were born from traumatic scenes. Wherever there has been trauma, there is a storyline of God trying to form. This is why it is absolutely imperative to be honest about where you come from because it reveals where you're going. Trauma is a very real conversation and we're not doing a good job with healthily discussing it, but there is always a logic, hallelujah, Hallelujah, of God behind traumatic things. Traumatic things is often the beginning point of the radiance of God being seen. Think about how difficult it would be for God to get glory from a perfect life and a perfect story and a life that is ideal. No, 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 no. The way the Lord is lifted is he finds his way into traumatic, ugly, murky beginnings and backgrounds and he uses the unlikely he uses the abnormal he uses the unusual it should be that when people hear where you come from that they are shocked that you are still alive it should be that when people find out that you never met your daddy that they are shocked that you have the type of confidence that you have it should be that when people find out that you were born into decades of poverty I'm not talking about uh, uh, generations of it I'm talking about years where ownership was nowhere in view when you were born to that what God is revealing to you is I am God and because I'm God I'm going to give you a trajectory I'll get there 11 and the end result is victory I'm here to tell you the goal of warfare hey hey the goal of warfare is not warfare but the objective of warfare is victory and we need a first definition for victory for victory so your life is how God does that. And so now we see some patterns here uh, that subsequently the nation of the Hebrews have received a decision of God. Your destiny is the decision of God. Where you're going is the decision of God. He is not making up his mind, Apostle Torrent. He is not in deliberation. He is not planning a thing. What he is doing is watching as your obedience draws you closer and closer to what he planned for you. Uh, but I find as it were in our text uh, that there's certain things that we need to lift up that's going to deliver us psychologically as we approach the land called the unknown okay now let's deal with that there is an unknown factor about your future there is an X factor something that you don't know yet it's not been all revealed just yet you don't know exactly the worlds and the rooms and the spaces and the possibilities you may be able to forecast it, but there's always going to be a surprise of God for what he's been doing in you. Now, this is why obedience, again, is important because God's not teaching you ancillary lessons. He's not teaching you lessons that won't be necessary for the future. And what I know about the spirit of grace is in his destiny didactics, he will teach you something in your immaturity so that in your maturity, you developed a mastery of it. Many of you don't know why you can't go where they can go. Many of you don't understand why you got to go to bed when you got to go to bed. Many of you don't know why you have an appetite for the type of information that you do. But it's not random. Elbow three people say it's not random. It's not random. It's not right. You don't understand why you have an affinity towards the stock market. You don't understand why God's got you studying global trends of leadership changes and advancement. It seems random to you, but everything the Holy Spirit is impressing upon your heart will be like a bullet in the hand of God. And when the season is right, you will have already have developed, I love your word, a full battery of diversity, a multiplicity of weapons that you can employ without the enemy finding 
thing out. Oh, you's a bad mamma jamma. You've been learning things all your life that you don't know you know. I said you are a dangerous vessel of the most high God. You've not just been learning survival. You've been learning scenic warfare. You didn't grow up in the ghetto just so you could have a rags to riches story. What the Lord used that environment to do is be the preliminary womb where you learn how to duck and dodge and move in. Come on Zion. Value your training. Don't you ever again allow the devil to use your testimony to disqualify you. You did not die. You were trained. You were not broken. You were trained. The devil wants you to have the wrong narrative about your pain tolerance but you are going to stand in Canaan as a trained man as a trained woman as a trained people the training of God, he uses, hey, he uses uncommon things, uncommon ways. And so now we have a formula here, Pastor Darcor, where we see Moses does something uh, inspired by God, right? So at the top of our text, the Bible said that God told Moses, he said, I want you to go around and I want you to choose some men. Now pay attention because this is extremely fundamental. Every strategy must choose. Every strategist must choose. You don't need need a default team come on here you don't need a default plan you don't need him and her in these spots because you don't have nobody else to fill them can I give you some builders advice if it ain't the right person leave the role empty don't you just start plucking people I love your word in places because there is a need you got to trust God that there is a people and there is a person somewhere but don't fill it with a random because then it could be an issue in war. Choose. Choose. In your business, choose. For your family, choose. For this next, choose. And don't let them choose you. You choose. If you are the strategist, you have the decision to make the right choice. In the name of Jesus, I've got to preach. I bind man pleasing off of you. In the name of Jesus, you will never again be forced into a decision because of what somebody else needs. Let the fear of man be broken off your life. People will pressure you to choose them. People will pressure you to see something in them that ain't even there yet. People will manipulate you and insert themselves in a level of unnecessary access to what you're doing next. But you have the right to choose. You have the right to choose. And God tells Moses, I want you to choose leaders now from every tribe. Don't choose them randomly and don't choose them based upon their availability. I want you to choose them because the decisions you make will be based upon the report they do bring back. Choose them. I want you to choose men around you. You, 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 and run from every tribe. And I want you uh, to go and I want you to measure it for me. I want you to scan it for me. I want you to bring back proof of what you see there. Now, I don't understand whether or not Moses knew exactly what God was teaching him. But what God was teaching him is you run the risk of not moving it to Canaan because of what you or the people around you can't see I'll get there if you can't see what I see then you definitely are not going with me because multiple visions I'm working in here is die vision and where there is more than one agenda let me hit this and more than one plan and more than one preference and more than one head you got the forces of darkness somewhere establishing a strong attack because we don't see the same thing but I believe God is sending people in this season that's going to see it with you I see it, I see it baby, I see it no, I don't know if they believe it but I still see it, yes a lot has happened but I still see it, if you can see it you can go into it choose them now when they went out, the spies went out, you know the story, they run into their first issue, and the first issue was uh, 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 the report, the report the, it was obscured. When they went there, they had anticipata anticipation that the land was going to be easy. They had expectation that when they got there they were going to see lilies and roses and rivers and, 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 and berries. Hallelujah. But when they got there there were freaks of nature there. 
What do you do when God calls you to a place and you want it to be vacant but it's occupied? What do you do when God says this is yours even though they've got it right now? What do you do when God says I promised this to you but I've allowed your adversary to temporarily steward it? You don't want to have church. I have allowed something that you are afraid of to be the landlord of something I promise you. I have allowed something that is molecularly illegal. Something that is a mixture of hell and earth and it's in your promise most of us if we despise our training we'll look at them giants and say I'm getting the heck out of here I can't stand this this ain't God maybe this is a deception but come on remember what I told you just because it's hard don't mean it's from hell God has called you to some hard assignments God has called you to some hard Ooh, I feel that somebody in here is in a hard place it's not a bitter place it's not an angry place it's just difficult but in your moments of difficulty your next realm of destiny is coming out of you don't run from the difficult who am I talking to in this Anglican church just because it's difficult don't mean you should run I need some gangsters in this room holler out I ain't never scared I wasn't scared when I was working for hell I'm not gonna come over here and have the Holy Ghost and run from some giant shout hallelujah he came into the land and they were there and they saw those that were there. Pay attention, every realm, every sphere that God has called you into is currently being manned. It's being held down, freaks of nature. The Anax were giants, they, they were giants. And now we see number one, Elder Jasmine, the first test was sight, uh, but now we're gonna go into a deeper meaning of this. The second test was size. The second test was size. After you see it, uh, you're now gonna be challenged to size it. The, the, the test of size is uh, if you see something bigger than you, if you see something beyond your current information, if you see see something that appears to be more advanced than where you've been will you allow here we go the weapon of intimidation to start causing you to forget what God said about you let me connect this do you know what intimidation is it is the weapon of the enemy in your psychological self that slowly moves you into disobedience I said it is a weapon of the enemy in your psychological self in the realm of your meditation that gradually moves you outside of the will of God. Lift your hands. In the name of Jesus, may the power, may the work, may the spirit of intimidation be broken off of you in the strong name of Jesus. Your God is the mighty God. Your God is the sovereign God. And he has called you to do what he told you to do. So get together and do what he said. Intimidation is tricky. It is always about size. Now, here is how it works. God never calls you to do what you can do. If you can do it, he did not call you to it. He only calls you to do what you cannot do. This is not about you. You are an instrument. You are a picture. You are an icon. If you walk up to Canaan like I got this, then the hand of God will lift upon you because then you're going to show your strength and not his. But when you go to the door of promise and you keep your bow, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to go in here. I'm not the one that's, and I'm honestly scared of what's over there. Then grace, then grace, then grace for a hard place. Hey, then grace and grace for a large thing. And grace and grace for the unknown comes upon you. Grace is the power that makes broken men mighty. Grace is the power that makes limited men full of abundance. Grace is the power that opens up the channels of revelation and helps you to know what you need to know when you need to know it. Open your mouth and say, Grace! We, we see that these spies now, they place emphasis on the content of the report. But the content of the report, is it strong? Is it few? Are there walls? There was accuracy in the details and deception in the view. The details of the report were accurate. 
So the real crisis, beloved, was not in them talking about the challenges and the, and the rivers and the shortcuts. The challenge and the crisis was in the eulogy. The fact that before they could even move any closer into this land filled with resource, the conclude of our text was a curse. The conclude of our text was a premature judgment. Realize this, that when you are afraid of what God is calling you into, Sister Kim Bacon, the enemy will try to use your tongue to get you to come into agreement with an alternate reality. I cannot tell you how absolutely essential it is to know when to shut up. When you are afraid, you just need to close your your mouth because if you start confessing over your life things that are already planned out then what's going to happen is you have illegally activated Lachelle the law of covenant and your life is going to be the byproduct of whose report you are going to believe even if I don't think I can do it I'm not going to let you know it what I'm going to do is stand here and look dumb until God shows up I'm going to stand here with the lifted hand until I feel differently but I'm not going to curse myself I'm like who? the nation the nation I believe in part elongated their journey because of what they said about themselves they started the journey with a negative decree they started the journey with a death sentence thinking that because this thing was bigger and older and wider and more complex that I can't even approach it because here is the challenge we look like grasshoppers to us and them the problem is not what your enemy underestimates about you. The problem is when y'all share the same view, God is trying to break your tie with the enemy's version of you, the enemy's story about you, the enemy's accusation about you. And if he can break your agreement with hell, he can bring you into the kingdom of heaven. Here is the real meaning of our text. People who have healthy esteem find the bravery for hard tasks. Can I put some pressure here? That means that wherever there is a low self-esteem, deception is next. I got Deception is not something that just happens. The enemy will find his way in what you do or do not believe about you, what you do or do not believe about God, and gradually pull you away from Cain and come away from that. Don't believe for that. Don't move into that. Where is the civil war in your esteem? What do you do to feel like you're really a good you? What happens around you to give you a security with what God has already predetermined about your life? You see, it's not the best strategy to have a view of yourself that already exists in defeat and from defeat. I don't care what the heck is going around you. Your intention has got to be intact. This is not who I'm going to be forever. I intend to get the victory. And it may not feel like that right Right now, but one of the things you ain't gonna stop me from doing, come on, go with me, is growing. You ain't gonna ever catch me. I'm working in here from growing. I would much rather die than be stagnant. I was not born to be stuck, and God is coming to pull a people out of sinking sand, out of miry clay, out of quicksand. We're a grasshopper. Now, what's interesting is there is a key figure on this squad, in this team, in this relationship landscape, and his name is Caleb. 
Look at somebody and say, get you a Caleb. Get you. Turn around and tell somebody, I need a Caleb. I need a Caleb. Every team, every project, every family, every program needs at least one somebody, ah, da, da, that's going to refuse to allow you to be distracted. I, I'm about to break the back of the devil on this one right here. You know, the purpose of godly relationship is to concentrate you. The purpose of godly romance is to concentrate you. And whenever you got people on your landscape who seem to be an assignment of distraction, they are the spies that secretly don't believe you are who you are. But you need a Caleb that'll stand up in the midst of pessimism, in the midst of negativity, that I don't care what they're talking about. We shall surely go up and possess the land. Come on, church. We need some focused friends. We need some focused teaching. Some focused conversation. Hallelujah. I will not be distracted. Tell the devil, shut up. Tell the record, shut up. Tell the facts, shut up. We are well able. Caleb, Caleb was the concentrator. Now here is, when you've got folk around you that are negative, many of us that are not moving is because the negative folk are louder than the concentrated folk. Uh, the negative folk are more louder and more vocal than them. Be very cautious about expecting to be coached and or pushed and or supported by folk that don't make you focus. Folk that don't say this is the standard for you. They may think that they can't do that but focus says you ain't them. I'm working in here and whenever you want to be them and live like them and copy them or envy them you have already surrendered your focus and you can't go to Canaan I love the weapon of Caleb he stood up in the board meeting and said hey shut up you would have called it rude he stood up and said everybody shut your mouth ah listen because this ain't the place for opinion and this ain't the place for perspective. And this ain't the place for rumor. This ain't the place for none of that. This is the place of faith. And if you're going to grow in your faith, you need to switch the volume levels of who's got your ear hostage. I'm working in here. In any organization, the most dangerous people are the ones that have the ear of the leader. And sometimes they're not always the closest one. What they'll do is they'll vicariously disseminate information to capture the ear of the man or the woman at the steering wheel but in the name of Jesus your ear is being delivered from the snare of darkness and the snare of distraction shout hallelujah we will surely possess the land look at what this statement was about we are able the enemy always is intimidated by your divine abilities. That's where low self-esteem comes from. Ignorance concerning native and or supernatural abilities. And if you are not acquainted with your abilities, you will feel inferior all the time. You see, God does not call you into stuff to kill you. He doesn't call you into stuff to be defeated. How then does he get the glory there? He puts some stuff in you that you don't realize is there yet, but you just need to show up in obedience to activate the next ability. Obe hey, 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 hey. Obedience activates abilities. Obedience activates abilities. Obey now and you'll see it later. Obey now and you'll feel able later. You don't have to have a calculator or scratch paper. All you got to do is have a yes, Lord. And when you have a yes, Lord, that moves quick. Then the abilities that are necessary to conquer in Canaan comes out of you like a well of water. So we've been dealing with strategy. But I want you to know if you don't deal with this esteem stuff, you can't trust what you're planning. 
You can't trust what you're building. If you don't have an honest conversation about how you really feel about you and what you're up against. I realize, Pastor David, there are so many people in the world that are unself-aware. They will champion causes that they created. They will rebuke you for what they do. They will challenge you for stuff that they do. And it is in that uneasy, unjust character platform that the provisions of God stall. And they stall because he wants you to be aware. Listen, let's have a talk. Good, bad, ugly, or indifferent, you've got to know yourself. You cannot be walking around ignorant. And here's a deal. Just like some of your strengths are subconscious, some of your weaknesses are too. They are not always a reflection of your value, but a picture of what you don't realize about yourself. It was years before I knew my eyebrows cussed. It was years before I realized that my hand was heavy. My sons and daughters would tell me all the time, you slapped the stew out of folk at the altar. And I honestly just did not know it. It took for my youngest daughter to say, yo, your hand is heavy for me to realize it. Don't think you know everything thing about you don't think because you look in the mirror every day that you are fully conscious and fully aware of how you show up and if you're not careful the enemy will use what you do subconsciously or what you do habitually to keep you out of what God is calling you to you got to know yourself you have to know yourself and when people help you learn you you can't be insulted Canaan is not for cowards. You got to have the guts to hear hard things about you. You've got to have the emotional resilience to have people tell you you're stubborn. You are inflexible. You don't follow up. And hearing that arms you for what's going on out there. If you're too sensitive and you think like grasshopper stuff, you talk grasshopper. You don't respond in grasshopper. Then you run into the worst trap that you can have in Canaan, which is the trap of camouflage. You go to Canaan, and because you don't like you, you try to blend in with whatever you like. <laughs> you start gravitating to that that doesn't make you distinct. So the beginning place, we're doing vision all March. We cannot do that without identity. What's going on in you? Mentally, how well have you recovered from trauma? Do you use your vulnerable moments to create new contracts with the devil? Canaan is too important for you to have low self-esteem. Canaan is too important for you to not be willing to hear wisdom around you. I don't know if you've Remember that I have a calling to the body of Christ that is prophetic. <laughs> and a part of what that means, the Spirit of God has been through me bellowing forth a cry to this people to reach for wisdom. I mean, unusual wisdom. The type of wisdom that you don't just get by Google. I'm talking about eternal wisdom that gives you a prudence for where you're going, a shrewdness for where you're going. Your muscularity needs to change, and you need to stop behaving like a grasshopper because if you see yourself as a grasshopper, there's only one destiny for you, and that's under the foot of giants. But if you know who you are, and you know what you ain't, and you know what you're capable of, and you know what you cannot do, then you have the full backing of heaven. God is calling his people out of an offensive posture. A posture of, 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 of indifference and irreverence towards what he's called you to do. This is not a life goal. We're not in this room because we ain't got nothing else to do. You don't go to school to keep up with America. You don't get married to satisfy your mama. And 
and you don't marry to hide your own struggles. These are matters of warfare. And the enemy knows what's under there. If you don't fix your view of self, I'm not a grasshopper. I, I didn't get saved to have low self-esteem. And sometimes poor doctrine will help you in your low self-esteem. Sometimes bad teaching will help you to have low self-esteem. And low self-esteem is not always timid. Sometimes some of the loudest people <laughs> you have to be so mature that you can be in a room and not be heard because you don't get rewarded by that stuff. I have one more warning from the Spirit of God. Be careful about what applause you are addicted to. You have to be very careful. Some of you can't hear well because of the need for applause. The harsh truth, Prophet Jason, is most of your obedience will not be recognized. <laughs> People don't see how God is making you obey when they're not looking. See, what they realize is your obvious obedience, you know, the stuff that's here. But there are some tough obedience lessons that are the continuation for your next wisdom. The danger is wherever you stopped obeying, he stopped talking. As you obey, you get wisdom. One step at a time. Hallelujah. One day at a time. One moment at a time. Obey. Keep your heart in that posture. And it will take you into rooms that you've never dreamed of. But you can't go in there with grasshopper talk, grasshopper conversation. You are in a war against stuff much bigger than you. Much bigger than most people in your family. you got to know what you're up against without reducing yourself unnecessarily. Father, heal the esteem. Now, you know the story. They, Caleb was the only one who saw it. <laughs> when you go into the book of Joshua, he was the last man standing of an entire generation because of his confession. I still see it. We are well able. I'm going to pray for you because what I want the Lord to do is give you a fresh relationship with your abilities in him. And I want him to help you to re-see what he made you to be. Don't allow what you're going through to change your vision of you, what God is calling you into to do. Just lift your hands for a minute before the Lord. You are the covenant-keeping God. Yes, you are the covenant-keeping God. Oh, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. You are Yahweh, the covenant keeping God. Oh, you are the covenant keeping God. Uh. Yes, you are, you are the covenant keeping God. Your name is Yahweh, Yahweh covenant, covenant keeping God. Keep Your name is Yahweh. Covenant keeping God. Keep singing that. Lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, you told me this morning you were doing something in the esteem of your people. And what they see, the lies of the enemy, that's where you want to go right now. The lies of the enemy concerning their identity. The lies of the enemy concerning their agility. The lies of the devil in how they see themselves, how they see their circumstance. In the strong name of Jesus, this people has been honed out of your side. This people has been upheld by your hand. These people have been born from your bowels my God. So right now in the name of Jesus, will you in this room separate, cut, break the cohesive bindings and tie of the devil on the esteem of these people. In the name of Jesus, pull them out of perfectionism, pull them from under illegal pressure, pull them from under wrong definition, pull them from under unfair standard, pull them from under fear 
fear-based movement and fear-based opportunity in the name of Jesus open their minds open them at the realm of their inner man and everything that exists there that should not be there only you can pull this out in the name of Jesus help this people to see themselves brand new in you in the name of Jesus help them not to try to be vindicated after the flesh help them to try not to have vengeance or vengeance after the flesh but have them to have their hope in you my God in the name of Jesus of Nazareth now father this people humbles themselves before you do not withhold your wisdom from this sanctuary do not withhold your instructions from this people but Lord we welcome your divine insight your divine instruction raise the Caleb's in this place that have value plus tool over the weapons of the devil and that can focus us now father focus your people every leader every man every woman every boy every girl every husband every wife and right now we judge every distraction oh yes we judge every competing voice every competing force that's working against our obedience in you we break our contract with the devil we break our contract with fear we break our contract with intimidation inferiority insecurity instability and we say that we are waxing stronger in our inner man we are waxing stronger in the stature of the son of god let that be so in this room in the name of jesus of nazareth and we are going to canaan and we are moving into conquest not by might nor by power but by the spirit of the living god focus us focus us focus us and make our footing sure focus us and make our vision clear focus us and help us to find our strength in you and you will keep your covenant and you will keep your covenant and you will keep your covenant yes you will establish your covenant with us you will establish your covenant with us you have established your covenant 